everybody, Hood and Cobra Commander 788 here. It's time for another vintage G.I. Joe toy review. And on this channel, for the entire month of April 2016, we are looking at Tigger Farce. Now, there were some of you guys out there that wanted me to look at Tiger Force Roadblock this week, and there were other guys out there that didn't want me to look at Tiger Force Roadblock. But if you've been paying attention to the patterns on this channel, you would have noticed that I always try to review one vehicle per month. I've already reviewed one vehicle this month, and I try to review the first version of an action figure before I review any subsequent versions of that figure. Now, based on those self-imposed rules, there's only one figure in the Tiger Force lineup that I could review this week, and it's Tiger Force Roadblock. I don't mind looking at Roadblock this week. Roadblock is one of my favorite characters. In fact, he may be right behind Stalker, which is my favorite character in G.I. Joe. And one of the great things about Tiger Force Month is it gives me a chance to look at these favorite characters again. And I need to give a special thanks to Blake Cabrera for hooking me up with this figure. Thank you very much. This one's for you. So, with pleasure, HCC 788 presents Tiger Force Roadblock. This is Tiger Force Roadblock, Tiger Force's heavy machine gunner, first introduced in 1988 and also available in 1989. He was discontinued in the year 1990, and there was no new Roadblock figure in 1990, and there was no new heavy machine gunner in 1990, so it did not have a replacement action figure that year. Tiger Force Roadblock is the third version of Roadblock, but he is a reissue of version one of Roadblock from 1984, using exactly the same mold but in different colors. There was a second version of Roadblock introduced between these two guys. In 1986, version 2 of Roadblock was completely different. Entirely different parts and different accessories. I think it's curious that when they decided to do a Tiger Force Roadblock, they went with a reissue of version 1 rather than the more recent version 2. Let's take a look at Tiger Force Roadblock's accessories starting with his helmet and oh my god, it is very yellow with black stripes. The design of this helmet is a standard helmet, and the standard helmet was available with a lot of G.I. Joe action figures, especially from 1982. Now, this does not have the holes in the side uh, like most standard helmets, like uh, Grunt's helmet here has holes in the sides. This one does not. That is a throwback to version 1 of Roadblock. Early releases of version 1 also did not have holes in the side of the helmet. The main issue with this helmet is it's bright yellow with black stripes. Now, we did not often get paint accessories and usually if you have paint on an accessory that's kind of a bonus but the choice to go with this color uh, this bright yellow and the black stripes on it that's uh, I think a very poor choice uh, it's reminiscent of the Cincinnati Bengals football helmet and not in a good way but honestly I never thought Roadblock needed a helmet I think he looks better without a helmet so we can just lose this thing his next accessory is his M2X machine gun and this is a modified M2 Browning 50 caliber machine gun. It is not an exact replica of that real world weapon, but it is pretty close. The M2 Browning began service in 1933. It is a very large, very powerful weapon. It's often mounted on vehicles, and it's sometimes used to shoot down aircraft. Uh, it's not intended to be a personal weapon carried by an individual and fired from the hip, as Roadblock is often portrayed as doing. The bullet this thing fires, the 50 caliber BMG round is very large. It's 5.45 inches long, including the cartridge, and the bullet is over half an inch wide. Roadblock is often portrayed as carrying his heavy machine gun and firing it like an assault rifle. And he's supposed to be really big and muscular and strong and apparently strong enough to be able to do that. But the thing is, even if you could do that, why would you want to do that? You're not going to be as accurate as you would if you just set the thing on the tripod that it's made for. To see what I mean, take a look at this video of an M2 Browning being fired. Because that machine gun is on the tripod, the tripod is sandbagged, and it still has a kick. So Roadblock, as strong as he is, if he's going to 
fire it from the hip, that thing's gonna spray all around. The machine gun can rotate on the tripod and the tripod is removable. It has a carrying handle right here and the carrying handle does fit in the figure's hand, so you can have him carrying the machine gun at his side. The version one machine gun is in light green and the Tiger Force version is in a very dark gray. This tripod is similar to the real world tripod for the M2 Browning. The tripod was called the M3 and this can attach to Roadblock's backpack. The backpack has a peg and that will fit in the hole on the bipod and you have to put that in very carefully because that peg is very thin and can crack off very easily. And it's best to put the bipod on with the two longer legs facing up. That brings us to the backpack and the backpack looks rather plain. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of detail. It has a carrying handle here. It has a peg there. Other than that, it's pretty plain, but it does have another feature. It has a removable ammunition box, and that just pegs in another peg there that's very small and can crack off very easily. So that's just something you need to be aware of if you're looking to purchase a Tiger Force roadblock or a version 1 roadblock. Check out that backpack and make sure both of those pegs are there. Let's look at the articulation on Tiger Force roadblock. He had the standard articulation for 1984 G.I. Joe action figures, the year version 1 of Roadblock was released. That means he could turn his head from left to right, he could also swing his arm up at the shoulder, and he could swivel his arm at the shoulder all the way around. He had a hinge at the elbow so he could move at the elbow about 90 degrees, and he had a swivel at the bicep, he could swivel his arm all the way around. The figure was held together with a rubber O-ring that looped around the inside. That allowed him to move at the torso a bit. He could move his, his legs apart about so far. He could move his legs at the hip about 90 degrees, and he could bend at the knee about 90 degrees. Let's look at the sculpt design and color of Tiger Force Roadblock, starting with his head. And this head, unfortunately, has the same shape as version 1's head, which I think, I always thought was kind of a weird shape. It's kind of elongated here in the back. Uh, looks kind of like an alien head to me. And I guess that fits uh, the helmet better, but I just think it looks very strange. I really much prefer the head of version 2. I just think that's a much more human-shaped skull. The head on Tiger Force Roadblock is very similar to the head on version 1. It has the same uh, mustache and little soul patch there. Uh, it's almost identical. In fact, you could almost swap these heads out and nobody would notice the difference, but the skin color is very slightly different. I think it's slightly lighter on the Tiger Force version uh, than the original version, but other than that, uh, these heads are almost identical. On his chest, he has light green straps over a dark green plain tank top, and that continues around to the back. Uh, now, this chest is kind of wide, and I believe that is intended to give him a bulkier and more muscular look. His arms are plain, average-sized, bare arms with gray gloves and, on his left wrist, a light green watch. When it came to making figures look big and muscular, this is about the best they could do in 1984. However, a couple years later, they came out with the Mail-Away Sergeant Slaughter, and this figure is huge. It's massive. It has a ton of muscles sculpted on here, and I really would have liked to see Roadblock with this kind of sculpt and this kind of body, because this is how Roadblock was portrayed in G.I. Joe media. Version 2 of Roadblock did succeed in making his arms look a bit bulkier, but I think Roadblock should be more Sergeant Slaughter sized. That's the Roadblock that we knew from the comic book and cartoon. On his waist, he has a light green belt and some pouches that goes all the way around. Then he has brown pants with yellow stripes. Yikes. Uh, then he has a light green knife on his right leg, and on his left leg he has a light green pistol. Now why is the pistol on his left leg? Is he left-handed? I don't think so. Uh, then he has some gray boots. I previously said there were two Tiger Force color schemes, but really when I look at the line more closely, there were three color schemes. Color scheme one had still pretty good military colors with your greens and browns and blacks, and those figures included Tiger Force, Duke, and Flint. Then Color Scheme 2 featured this really bright orange with black Tiger Stripes. Uh, figures with that color scheme included Sky Striker and Torpedo and Lifeline. And then there was a third color scheme which still had pretty good military colors but for some reason incorporated yellow stripes. Uh, figures with that color scheme included Roadblock as well as Dusty. The yellow stripes are very unfortunate. They stand out. They don't work for camouflage. Uh, they mar a figure that would otherwise look very impressive. I mean, the color scheme on Roadblock, if you ignore the helmet, 
is not bad, but you have those bright yellow stripes. Let's take a look at Tiger Force Roadblocks file card, and we will compare this file card with the version 1 file card, and why not compare it also with version 2 file card. The file card for version 2 of Roadblock changed the portrait from the version 1 file card, uh, and obviously the background color, but the text remained the same. They didn't change any of the text. Tiger Force Roadblocks file card does have new text, so let's get to that. Uh, first of all, we have his faction as G.I. Joe. We have a portrait of Roadblock here uh, that is very similar to the portrait in the version 1 file card, but with his Tiger Force colors. It has his code name as Roadblock. He is the Tiger Force heavy machine gunner there in small print. His file name is Marvin F. Hinton. Uh, his primary military specialty is heavy machine gunner. His secondary military specialty is cook, and that is explained below. And his birthplace is Biloxi, Mississippi. Version 3 of the file card changed his serial number, and I don't know why they do that. That's a pet peeve of mine. His grade is E5, and that is an update from version 1 and version 2, uh, which had his grade as E4. So Roadblock got promoted, and that's something that I like. I wish this had happened more often. Uh, most G.I. Joes uh, had the same rank, essentially through the, their whole run in the line. Uh, but really, I think most of them probably would have been promoted here and there, uh, and they actually did that for Roadblock. This section says, Roadblock's dream was to be a gourmet chef. He was working as a bouncer to earn money to attend the Escoffier School in France when a recruiter convinced him that the army could train him just as well. Escoffier School refers to Auguste Escoffier, a French chef and culinary writer, and France's preeminent chef in the early 20th century. At boot camp, Roadblock found army menus and preparation techniques too appalling. He remained steadfast in his goal to be a chef, but at the same time developed a new skill, being a heavy machine gunner. This is similar to the version 1 file card, but the version 1 file card just says that Roadblock joined but found army menus and preparation techniques too appalling, transferred to the infantry. Let's talk about Roadblock's career path. First of all, if an army recruiter can convince him that they can train him to be a gourmet chef, he is really gullible. And when he found out the truth and that it was just too appalling in the army, his transfer to the infantry is another very strange career choice. The Tiger Force file card goes on. It says he was selected by Tiger Force because of his ability to operate a heavy machine gun. In addition, he could transform simple K rations into gourmet delicacies. No, he can't. Let's talk about K rations. A K ration included three boxed meals, and it was intended to be the daily food allotment for a single soldier for a single day. K rations were used in World War II, and they were criticized for having insufficient caloric and vitamin content, and they were obsolete by 1948. So if it's 1988 and you find a K ration still around, don't eat it. You know what kind of food was in a K ration? A K ration menu included, but was not limited to, canned chopped ham and eggs, biscuits, dextrose or malted milk tablets, water purification tablets, canned processed American cheese, servalet sausage, beef or pork loaf, chocolate bar, chewing gum, packet of toilet paper tissues, and a four pack of cigarettes. You're not gonna make any gourmet delicacies out of that stuff, but it would make a really good episode of Chopped. Welcome back to the the K-Ration Challenge. Roadblock, what have you prepared for our judges? With these K-Ration ingredients, I made a boiled lobster. Hmm, very impressive. Bazooka, what have you made for us? Fudgies. This bottom section has a quote, and it has some pretty good, reasonably accurate information about the 50 caliber Browning. It says, a 50 caliber Browning weighs 84 pounds. Add 50 pounds for the ammo, that's about 134 pounds of steel generating 2,930 feet per second in muzzle velocity at a cyclical rate of 550 RPM. And you have one awesome underline, machine gun, exclamation point. Anybody who can handle that doesn't need a machine gun to keep me away. Taking a look at Tiger Force Roadblock and G.I. Joe Media, there were no cartoon appearances of Roadblock in his Tiger Force uniform. However, there were many appearances of Roadblock in his other uniforms. In the cartoon series, Roadblock first appeared in Revenge of Cobra Part 1 and was very prominent in many episodes of the cartoon. He even had some good moments in the G.I. Joe animated movie in 1987, where he had some scenes where he carried 
a mutating Cobra Commander to escape from Cobra Law. Those were very creepy scenes, but at least they made you feel something, which most of the movie did not. And you do want a movie to make you feel something, even if what it makes you feel is creeped out. In the G.I. Joe comic book, again, there are no appearances of Roadblock in his Tiger Force uniform, as far as I can tell. I do not own every issue of the comic book, but I have not been able to find any references to a Tiger Force Roadblock. Tiger Force did appear in the G.I. Joe comic book, including the Special Mission series, but not Tiger Force Roadblock as far as I can tell. In issue number 93 of the regular series, we do see Tiger Force vehicles, and Roadblock is in a Tiger Force vehicle, but he's still not wearing his Tiger Force uniform. He's wearing his version 2 uniform. Roadblock first appeared in the G.I. Joe comic books in issue number 22, along with Duke, and after that, he was a fixture. He had many great appearances and great moments. He fought Storm Shadow, the ninja, and he won. And time and again, he showed good character and courage. He is one of my favorite characters in G.I. Joe. He's very down-to-earth. Uh, he physically towered over his teammates, but he didn't need to make others feel small. It's hard to pick a favorite Roadblock moment, but one great moment came in issue number 39. A Roadblock and Gung Ho are building a rope bridge and talking about the Boy Scouts, and Roadblock admits that he was a Boy Scout and a choir boy. Now, Gung Ho says back in the bayou they thought those things were sissy. Now, Roadblock is obviously no sissy, but he's very secure in his own personality. This scene in issue number 39 is important. It's not plot, but these scenes are vital. This isn't just banter, it's character building. It shows a contrast between how Roadblock and Gung Ho see the world, and it adds another dimension to Roadblock's character. This really is solid writing. You may have enjoyed reading G.I. Joe comic books for the action scenes, but it's character building scenes like this that made the G.I. Joe comic book stand head and shoulders above other action comics. What do I think of the character of Roadblock overall? I think he's cool. My daughter just really wanted me to use this in a video. There, I used it. You happy? What do I think of the Tiger Force Roadblock action figure overall? It's another middle-of-the-road figure. Like Tiger Force Flint, it just doesn't add anything to the original, which is vital if you're going to reissue an old toy just with different colors. That yellow tiger-striped helmet looks terrible. It's an eyesore. My memories of Tiger Force from when I was a kid are a little bit fuzzy. I know I didn't have all of the Tiger Force action figures, or really even very many of them. Uh, I am pretty sure that I got Tiger Force Roadblock, though, uh, because like with Tiger Force Duke, I was trying to replace my original roadblock, which had been lost or broken before then. But I do not remember that yellow helmet. I must have lost that thing right away, and maybe intentionally. I think the yellow stripes on the trousers were a mistake. Those stripes could have been black, and I think that would have looked pretty good. Tiger Force Roadblock again has that unfortunate alien head shape from version 1 Roadblock, and I really don't like that. I really preferred the head of version 2 Roadblock, and maybe it would have been better to make the Tiger Force Roadblock a remake of version 2 of Roadblock instead of version 1. After all, I didn't really care for the colors on version 2, so an update of the colors on that action figure I might have really liked. I think the basic idea of Tiger Force is not bad. I mean, you're taking captured enemy vehicles, repainting them, and then using them against the enemy. That's a pretty clever idea, and it's a clever way of reissuing old toys. But I think it would have been better if Tiger Force had some specific mission or some specific enemy to fight. Tiger Force versus Python Patrol would have been the obvious choice, but Python Patrol didn't come out until the year after Tiger Force was introduced. So when Python Patrol was coming in, Tiger Force was kind of on its way out. If Tiger Force and Python Patrol had been released at the same time, we would have had had some great head-to-head -head matchups between characters and vehicles. As it was, Tiger Force didn't seem to have any real purpose other than for Hasbro to cheaply reissue old toys. And that just ain't good enough. Tiger Force Month has admittedly been an exercise in mediocrity, but it has given us a chance to take a longer view of this sub-team. And I think that's kind of important because as G.I. Joe moved forward into the 1990s, it had a lot more sub-teams, maybe too many, to the point that maybe the main line lost its focus. And maybe that started with Tiger 
Tiger Force. We've looked at the real world inspiration for Tiger Force with the NATO Tiger Association. We've looked for some overarching themes and threads. We've looked at the color schemes and the artistic choices. And we've taken a second look at some favorite characters. But I must bring Tiger Force Month to a close. I hope you enjoyed this surprise theme month. I enjoyed it, but next week we're going to look at something completely different. Thanks for watching. I hope you stick around. We've got a lot of cool stuff coming up. It's going to be a fun ride. And until next time, remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe. Force. Vehicles and figures sold separately. Joe, Joe.